sometimes there, there is no intuition. I mean, that's the problem with economics. We need to be able to explain what we do, and this is why this is such a wonderful uh, setup. Okay, good morning. Welcome to the third lecture of uh, Introduction to Macro, Advanced Macro Analysis. And today we're going to talk about the overlapping generations model in full blown detail. So uh, you will remember we started the course with a treatment of the basics of the supply side of the economy in the long run. We've talked about capital, labor, and technical progress and how they interact to produce economic growth in the, in the long run. Uh, the OLG model is an attempt uh, to bring microeconomic foundations to this process. The idea is to understand how conscious decisions by households and firms can lead to the processes that uh, were formulated in the solo model in a fairly mechanical and uh, ad hoc way. Today we're going to review the last lecture briefly and then I'd like to go into the um, overlapping generations model in detail describing the building blocks which should alert you to the general purpose of a model is to organize our thoughts and we want to organize our thoughts in a way that map into what people, uh, agents, economic agents, households and firms do and uh, they have preferences, they uh, use different forms of, of technological relationships um, to produce goods and services and bring those to the people who want them, and that's what the market's for. So we want to understand that in a very basic level and see how that interacts. So we need to discuss those things in detail. Then we'll move on to describe um, a market equilibrium in which generations um, interact with each other, and that's the whole point of calling an overlapping generation model, is to show that um, in a very fundamental way there is heterogeneity in this model. So this is not a representative agent model. At any point in time, there are two generations alive uh, that have economic interests in trading with uh, each other. And uh, there's an old generation and a young generation. And that's also quite interesting to, to apply. It's useful to apply to our current situation because these, uh, the relative weights of those two generations, those two generations, the old and the young, at any point in time can change. And that would be uh, fundamental to understanding the, uh, the appeal of this model. As I told you last time, this, the model we're discussing today was developed by Peter Diamond in the 1960s, but in fact, uh, it's, a, it's an extension of Paul Samuelson's epic uh, contribution in 1958, um, the overlapping generations model uh, of money. To this, later on in this course, we'll use the same model to, to show how money, uh, worthless paper, or any sort of uh, worthless trinket uh, that people uh, agree to use can be exactly the mechanism that uh, moves an economy away from an autarkic uh, equilibrium to one in which people uh, trade with each other. In this model, capital is being traded, so the, the fundamental uh, means of payment is actually uh, an asset which is productive uh, in its own right. So we'll, we won't see this uh, so clearly, but uh, it's useful to start to think about this generational structure initially. And then we'll go back and rediscuss or re-examine re the golden rule. This is a prescription by a central planner who had an objective in mind in the, in the solo model. It was maximizing consumption per capita in the steady state. And again, the insight there is that uh, per capita GDP is not an objective per se. What matters is really what people consume out of that GDP. Um, if if we're, we've got a big GDP which we're just reinvesting, uh, at a very high rate, uh, it doesn't really benefit anyone. It benefits uh, some empty notion of producing lots of goods and services, but not necessarily goods and services that make us happy in the end. So that's why the golden rule is such an interesting concept. We, we used uh, the Samuelson, um, or the, the solo model, as an approach to, to doing this. The Samuelson uh, insight, or the, the Samuelson diamond insight, would be to use this model to think about um, the market's ability to reach uh, this golden rule on its own. And we already saw that the solo model uh, need not reach the golden rule on its own. And I'd like to give you um, a very important intuition as well. The, the, the approach of, this, of the golden rule is to ask the question, what, what would a social planner do if a person had the ability to actually um, do as well as or better than the market 
uh, by some sort of planning rule or planning decision, what would that uh, person choose? What would she do? And that is um, not necessarily an advocacy for central planning, but it's just a question that economists uh, are free to, free to, uh, to, to ask and to, to answer if, to the best of their ability under the, the constraint that the, the problem is actually one that can be solved. So a lot of people have criticized the social planner concept because it, it doesn't seem to have an analog in the real world, but we do, uh, we can imagine uh, a world, especially today with digital technologies that these types of uh, planning, central planning decisions would work considerably better than they did in the 1920s under the, the Soviet Union. And even if we don't think it's a great idea, we can still ask the question, can the market actually come close to achieving the theoretical first best? And then we'll use that, um, the insights we get from the OLG model, um, including its imperfections, because the OLG model will not necessarily reach the first best. It will ne necessarily replicate the, the social planner's optimum. We can ask whether policy can improve the outcome, and we'll have two nice examples uh, to conclude with. Okay, so let's go to last week's uh, analysis. We, we finished up the solo model. We discussed the, the notion of comparative statics. This is a very important economic uh, concept in uh, both economic growth and other types of economic um, models. The idea would be, what is the consequence of changing a, a particular parameter that is given to the agents and not really movable? We ask that question because we'd like to see if changing um, a certain uh, fundamental assumption might actually change the outcome. Okay, and that the comparative statics analysis has proved useful over the past um, 150 years of economic analysis. And we'll do that, we did that with the solo model and showed that uh, you can change parameters like the rate of uh, depreciation, the rate of technological progress, the uh, savings rate of, of economic agents, the rate of population growth, and trace through the effects on economies, um, if you like, across a cross section. So we could use this model to explain why some countries are rich and some people, some countries are poor. And we also noticed that the model has uh, implications for how long it takes to reach the um, purported um, steady state that we're looking for. And it turns out that's a very slow rate. Okay, and keep that in mind when we talk later about other aspects of growth models. Um, we also talked about the golden rule. And we talked about the golden rule in the context of um, how much you'd have to save to reach this optimum. Um, even though that is not optimally chosen. To move for, for, towards a, a model where purposeful agents choose uh, savings behavior, we need to actually ask how the interest rate incentivizes agents to save or not. And then we have to ask how the interest rate comes about in a freely functioning uh, neoclassical model where the savers and borrowers demanders of capital interact in a, in a market with, uh, with free to price deter determination. So this would give us the, uh, gave us the motivation of looking at the factor price frontier. This sort of invented by Paul Samuelson a long time ago as a way of thinking about uh, neoclassical, functional neoclassical in income distribution, meaning if, if factors are paid their marginal products, what kind of factor price uh, outcomes could we observe? And it's very intuitive. Um, we assume a production function that has constant returns to scale. So the Euler's, uh, Euler's equation for functions of um, linear homogeneity implies that basically factors paid their marginal products will effectively exhaust the output of the economy. Um, so that very fundamental equation will guide us uh, through most of this course because we will be assuming that uh, the economy is fundamentally characterized by constant returns to scale. So if capital and labor receive their marginal products in a competitive setting, then there will be no excess profits. Profit of capital, be it high or low, is exactly equal to its marginal product in production. This is a benchmark we should keep in mind. And uh, I urge all of you to study the derivation of the factor price frontier because it is really the, the heart of um, neoclassical income distribution theory. And even if you don't like that, even if you'd like to adopt a Marxian or a Srafian or some other notion of income distribution or monopsonist 
uh, view, you still need to understand what you're criticizing. So this is the benchmark against which we compare um, perhaps more realistic notions of income distribution. And then we would into the introduction to the, the diamond models. This lengthy introduction today is to, to get people revved up for this fairly technical uh, model, at least for many of you. Uh, economics is still uh, a notion of graphs and not necessarily a formal methods. This is to get you thinking about microeconomic foundations. So we will discuss explicitly preferences. We'll discuss technology, market form, equilibrium, and then compare equilibria across different parameter constellations. Okay, so let's, um, let's continue that discussion um, now. Remember, the OLG model is designed to implicate, uh, to, to, to study the implications of private behavior on a public outcome, which is capital formation and the associated growth dynamics that we associate, we, we put on capital formation. Um, the best example I can think of right now is China, uh, an economy with very high savings rate, very high rate of economic growth compared to its own past and compared to the rest of the OA the developed world and the developing world and try to make some link with economic welfare at the same time. And we can do that because we're looking at individual households. The, um, the Phelps problem of uh, the golden rule, the modified golden rule, we're always choosing consumption per capita and even that's not necessarily a desideratum. There may be a, so a cost associated with more consumption per capita that are not really well covered in the in a model without looking at the utility of agents and the relative valuation of increments to consumption. Um, and that's what we're gonna to do today. We're gonna to actually get into that into detail. So these models therefore can be used to think about policy. We can also use it to think about uncertainty. This model will not have labor supply that's endogenous, but you could easily put it in. You could easily add uh, a bequest motive. This bequest motive could be uh, motivated by the desire to make children and offspring in general hap as happy as possible. It could also be used to uh, extract behavior from children. Uh, all these things have been done before. Um, we're gonna you know, even think about unintentional um, bequests because no one really knows when uh, they leave this, this, uh, this earthly existence. So all these things can be incorporated. So the model is really a baseline. I'm trying to make uh, a basic point to master's students and for those who are interested, this would be a great place to start um, picking up the pencil and paper and trying to do this um, on your own. This model has great implications for pension systems. It's been used in a more detailed fun form to look at those questions, um, moving from a pay-as-you-go system to a, a funded system or some sort of mix, uh, thinking hard about why you'd like to have a mix instead of having all ca capital based or fully funded uh, pension systems or fully pay-as-you-go. You can use this model to think about labor taxation and its effects. You can also think about asset pricing and the implication of asset price uh, bubbles, possibly uh, unsustainable uh, evolution of certain prices uh, and the effect that it has on the real economy and such, uh, such models. And also think about, uh, as I said before, um, altruism. So let's go quickly into the notation, remind ourselves what we're, we're dealing with. We're dealing with an economy that is growing, and I'm going to shut down technical progress for the time being. So we'll deal with a, with a static production function, but growth is still happening in, ter in terms of GDP because we have growth of the population. So think back of the solo model, the economy's uh, fundamental uh, production factor is population, which is employed, and for simplicity, we'll just put those equal to each other. This is a full, econ full employment economy. And we'll consider the rate of growth of that uh, mass of, of input um, at, as little n. So little n is the growth rate. We're, we're dealing with a discrete time model. So you can think of um, the population at any point in time solving a difference equation. The current value of, of um, lt is equal to some l0 times uh, one plus n raised to the teeth power. Okay, so that's a, that would be the solution to the difference equation. All you need to know is t, and then you know what um, lt is. Okay, so that's going to be the source of growth in our, our economy. And as a result, successive generations will be larger in size. 
and they will continue to exert pressure on the, on the environment, if you will. This is a great model, by the way, for looking at environmental damage. Um, it's been done before, but uh, there's all, lots of new interesting work to do. If you think that there's a finite resource, think of the environment, think of the, the global temperature, the carbon uh, burden of the economy as being a finite resource, then every future generation in, in increasing numbers puts an excess and increasing burden on that, on that fixed uh, resource. There may be some sort of technical progress that offsets it, but you know, that's, that's what you put in the model is what you're going to eventually uh, be able to, to tickle out. So uh, no, no further comment there. But uh, the key thing is this, uh, the next line, which deals with the, the generational structure. At any point in time, T, there are uh, young and old uh, people around, and both of them have interests in consumption. Uh, C1T would be the consumption of those who are currently young, and C2T would be the consumption um, of each person, so per capita, uh, of each old person in period T. Okay, so these, these are simultaneous claims on resources that are being produced. Now, obviously, C1T and C2T are, are different people, people's consumption, so they're planned by different people, and they have different interests, and uh, the old person's consumption, C2T, uh, will, will correspond to someone's decision in C uh, in, in T minus 1. So the C1, T minus 1, is basically the, the consumption one would associate with the person who is currently old consuming uh, C2T. Now, in, when you're young, you, say, you do some savings. You don't save when you're old because there's no pension, uh, there's no uh, bequest uh, motive, so people won't do that. They'll just basically dissave. So within the economy, at any point in time, you have dissaving going on. And ST is the, is the savings by the, the, by the individuals in period T by the, who are young. Okay, so that's one of their control variables, if you like, to decide as they move forward with a view of, of creating enough uh, resources for, for that particular individual in period two of their life, when they become older in T plus one. Um, we're gonna assume that wages are paid to those who work and labor supply is inelastic, so there'll be exactly, for each individual household, uh, omega T available uh, from which savings uh, can occur or consumption can be um, paid. This is a uh, moneyless economy, so we're, we're talking about it. in any period in time we have a single good. The only um, differentiation of goods is the good is a differentiation of goods over time as they are carried forward as potential productive pr production uh, productive assets, capital. So goods can be converted into either consumption or capital and back and forth. Um, and then this, um, these goods, once they've been uh, sort of nailed down and used in production, they get used up at a capital depreciation rate delta. So we can think about um, already, if there's a market out there, um, the, you can think of the market uh, paying a, a gross rate of return um, on savings that are uh, decided in period T. And this, uh, you would think about this as, I mean, the one way I like to think about this is, you, um, you save by buying a Mercedes-Benz, and then you, you sort of rent it out to some taxi company who drives it around the, the city for a while and gives it back to you in the second period, and then you can trade that in for some consumption. And that car you're getting back will have depreciated a little bit after it's been used in, in, uh, in, uh, in service as a capital good, and that would be th thought of as delta times uh, KT. So uh, what actually remains for the person as a mass of resources for consumption in the second period has to reflect that. So it'll be one minus delta plus whatever uh, productivity that at the margin was generated by that uh, capital good. And that's gonna be given later, we'll see, by, as a marginal productivity of, of capital in that period. Okay, so if you think about it, we can easily concoct a, um, a net interest rate by subtracting one from that capital R. It's just kind of like the, um, what you get on top. You get, the, you get something like the car back, maybe run down a little bit. You're gonna literally wanna have a bit of compensation for that depreciation. Um, ex ante, maybe you won't get it, depends on the market clearing price, but 
in the end, RT is, is going to reflect to you a compensation also for this loss of capital that occurs through use in production. Okay, and then you have um, uh, your inpatients. So we're going to write down utility in a second. It's going to reflect utility over two periods consumption, when you're young and when you're old, and you decide when you're young. And beta is going to be the relative weight you put on future utility. So it's one divided by one plus some sort of, so, some sort of uh, private um, rate of preference, some sort of um, subjective discount rate, if you like. Okay, so it's a, you know, if beta is very close to one, that would mean that we're pretty, pretty patient. We're willing to, to, uh, to wait for consumption in the future. And if beta is low, that means we're impatient. We have a high implicit um, social or, sorry, private... Uh, discount uh, rate of, or rate of time preference. Okay, so to get, to get moving, we really have to move, talk about the, the, the way these factor prices are determined in a decentralized economy. So we need to consider uh, firms which use the factors of production in this economy. There are two of them, capital and labor. And they're price takers, price meaning factor price, the price of, of labor is the wage, the price of capital is the the rental rate, um, we, we talk about the gross rental rate because the firm has to basically uh, return the capital good at the end of the day to the, to the owner. And constant returns would imply that they, uh, well, they maximize profits, they pay factors, uh, their marginal product, and there's no excess profit for any firm regardless of the scale. So we can talk about a representative firm. The scalability of firms in this economy is, is completely... Um, it's completely flexible. There's no decreasing return at any margin. So we can speak of a representative firm. It doesn't really matter to us. Okay. So having done that, we can think of all the potential combinations that a firm could pay uh, to factors, these two factors, um, under these assumptions. Okay. So think of the profit maximization problem. And in section, you will have seen this. Um, and I urge you all to do it on your own because it's a nice derivation. Uh, to think about what a profit maximizing firm can effectively afford to pay its factors. So one way of thinking about it is just a maximization problem. Given a wage, what can the firm afford to pay the other factor? Okay, that's a simple type of problem. You can think of, well, think of the, what is the maximum wage a firm could pay given um, a rental rate it pays on, on capital. So there's two, two different perspectives of the same problem. Okay, and the answer would be this curve, this curve which is uh, con- uh, convex to the origin, and that means that any ray that connects uh, two points on the curve, uh, those points along the ray are lying above the curve, okay, and the origin is, is uh, in the corner. So you can see immediately that the higher the wage that a firm can, would pay to, to, uh, to its workers would necessarily imply a lower rate of, of return or rate of, of rental, net rate of rent, uh, rental rate on capital. Um, and that just falls out of the, the availability of resources of a profit maximizing firm to do, uh, to pay that, um, to pay that rental. So you can imagine various points along the curve, and then it's easy to show with calculus that the slope of the curve at any point is going to be exactly given by the capital labor ratio in production. Okay, so that's a nice demonstration that you will see in the section. Okay, and there's, um, it's, it's actually a very, very simple, elegant uh, proof. And you can see right away that if we choose a, a point on that curve, um, which is determined by technology, by the way, if we choose a point on that curve that has a very high wage, the low capital rental rate will necessarily imply a capital labor ratio, which is high. If you choose, to the contrary, a, a point in the lower southeast, uh, you'll have a, 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 a low wage, a very high rate of return on capital, kind of makes sense, but implicit will also be a very low capital labor ratio. Okay, so um, labor will basically um, be used much more intensely, um, intensively relative to capital, given those um, factor prices. Okay, that's an you know one way of thinking about what happened in Germany, for example. Germany used to be known as a very very capital intensive con com uh, country when I was when I first came here in, in, and before. And uh, in, the, in the course of the Hartz reforms, the, the wage level at the median and at various 
uh, quantiles of the wage distribution has fallen in real terms. Um, and you can really see, uh, looking at the German discussion, there's been more employment, less investment. It, you can think of this whole process as just reflecting movement along a factor price frontier. Um, at the same time, one, one, one cannot forget that this thing will move over time. If we have technical progress, more and more uh, output is possible with given wage, with given uh, capital and labor combinations, meaning that um, as we move through time, holding one of those factor prices constant would make it possible to pay the other factor more and more. So keeping the wage constant means that profits start to rise. Uh, keeping the, the rental rate constant would imply that wages could also rise, or you could have some combination of the, few, of the two. Okay, so if you add depreciation to this, you're doing nothing more than just slicing off or hiving off a certain amount of output for the replacement of, of cap, capital. So we could think of a net output um, relationship and the wage and the rental rate reflect positive depreciation. Previously, I derived this curve um, mentally using uh, with, without appealing to a, a depreciation at all. Okay, so it should be clear to you that in, in a high depreciation economy, there's gonna be less output in net around to make us, to make us uh, happy with consumption or to, uh, to provide us with investment for the future. Okay, so how do, how do agents, how do households, who by the way own the capital, okay, so even though the, the households know that, they can't really influence the general equilibrium, they're just gonna behave as if they're price takers at every moment. They are responsible both for supplying the labor and supplying the capital. And we don't make any statement about the distribution. There's no uh, wealthy class in this model that own all the capital and the workers do all the work. This is a, a representative agent model. So keep that in mind, it's a very important uh, benchmark in economics, uh, one that has become uh, somewhat uh, critical um, and criticized um, in developing future insights on how the economy actually works. We think that economies with distributional issues may actually behave differently. Um, think about optimal behavior in this economy. Think about a savings decision of the young generation uh, earning omega wage for an inelastic supply of labor. Now this, this household is gonna supply one unit of labor come hell or high water because that's all it does. In a more advanced model, you could have some endogenous labor supply. Households might wanna work harder if the wage is high and work less if the wage is low. Um, but let's start uh, with the basics. So we're optimizing um, the outcome for the household. We're choosing um, the best possible outcome for a household as a solution to this problem. This problem basically states that uh, utility is, the, is a separable uh, function of, of consumption today and consumption tomorrow. And I'm choosing my consumption today and my consumption tomorrow as a young person in this economy. C1 uh, T is current consumption. C2 T plus one is consumption uh, tomorrow. I can't do this without constraints. And in a market version of this model, I have to obey uh, the following constraint. What I consume tomorrow is exactly what I earn today uh, less what I consume today, and then basically multiplied by the, the rate of, of factor payment, I will get on this savings as a capital good in the second period, okay? And we're gonna assume that these utility, this utility function is time separable, I already said that, and this common uh, felicity function or um, time um, sort of temporal utility function at any point in time is the same. It doesn't change over time. Its first derivative is positive, second derivative is negative. It's a concave function of consumption. Now we can basically use the Lagrange approach to, the solve, to the solve this problem. We can also just, just do brute force and, and, and use the constraint to eliminate one of the choice variables. So I will rewrite the problem as simply a choice of savings today. By, by choosing my savings today, given that I'm working one unit of time earning omega, means I've already decided how much I'm gonna to consume today because what I don't save, I, I can consume and I'm not gonna throw resources out the window. And what, whatever's basically saved will accumulate will yield to me in this perfect foresight model, okay, I know what R, RT plus one is, even though it's gonna happen in the next period, that's the, 
the, um, the benchmark uh, perfect foresight version of the OLG model uh, means that I know exactly what I'm going to be able to consume tomorrow, which is RT plus 1 times ST. Okay? So it's a very simple problem that anyone who knows how to do calculus can solve. Okay? And the, the utility functions make it very, uh, make us confident that we don't have, we're not going to have multiple um, inflection points. We're not going to have different, we're not going to have any further choice uh, as, as, an, as a maximizer, we just choose the inflection point um, and make sure it corresponds to a maximum of utility. So we'll look at the second derivative with respect to S and make sure that it's, that it's negative. And um, basically, we've solved the problem. There's no bequest mo motives in this model, so it's a very simple problem to solve, and everyone should be able to do it. I know Andreas does this with the log form of U. Uh, you should be able to do it with other forms as well, linear quadratic or things like that. The first order condition is a single first order condition. Okay, it says the marginal utility of consumption today is equal to the value of utility I get from that savings I will consider as an alternative um, evaluated at the marginal utility of um, giving me marginal utility tomorrow, um, evaluated at the consumption tomorrow, and I'm going to discount that back using beta. Okay, so if I if I save one unit of consumption, I lose some utility today, I get it back tomorrow, um, and I get RT plus one units of that, and I multiply it by the marginal utility of consumption tomorrow, and I discount it back using beta. It's a very simple uh, problem. Um, we'll see this in macroeconomics co constantly. It's basically a version of some sort of optimality conditions. We call it an Euler equation in a multi-period model. Um, or a Euler equation, as some Americans say. Um, I, the French would probably say Euler, Euler uh, equation. <laughs> anyway, um, sometimes you have to laugh at your own jokes. Um, at the optimum, it's, it's very intuitive. Okay, So it's kind of a variational argument. If I move consumption around the margin, I'm not going to make myself any better. I'm at the top of the hill, so to speak. One way of thinking about this problem is it's like a mountain. And when you get to the mountain, you can look uh, right and left, back and forth, and you don't see any gain to moving away from where you are. So you've reached the top of the mountain. That's a way of understanding uh, this problem. OK, so once having done that, we can either solve directly for a consumption and savings function given uh, the wage today and the prevailing uh, return to capital expected um, to prevail tomorrow. And we can look at changes in uh, things the agent takes as exogenous, including the, the, the factor prices. Okay, so we can we can use calculus to tease out uh, the reaction of optimal behavior, especially savings. That's the most important thing. How does a household respond to changes in the savings rate? Um, we can write a consumption function. Uh, if we're lucky, we can write it in closed form, so we can write consumption as a function of stuff on the right hand side, or we have to look at the local behavior um, of consumption as a function of uh, the current wage and you know, with a mind to the fact that it may change as we move farther away from where we started. So we're going to write a savings function as the outcome of that exercise. And we're going to use the capital, we're going to use capital S as an indicator of this function. It's going to be a function of two variables. It's going to be a function of the wage. And it's going to be a function of the rate of return on capital in the following period. And this is going to characterize the behavior of the currently young uh, generation. Okay? And it's easy to show, um, it's easy to, sh easy to show that uh, the first partial derivative with respect to the wage is positive for all values. Higher wages will lead to more savings because you want to consume more tomorrow as well as today. So you'll spread your uh, income across the two periods. Uh, the curious uh, Part of this problem is, is the ambiguity of the second, of the, the second argument. Uh, the first partial derivative of S with respect to R can be positive or negative, depending on whether the substitution effect or the income effect is larger. Um, generally, we'll assume that the substitution effect will, will dominate. Uh, the substitution effect means that uh, an increase in interest rates makes consumption tomorrow cheaper, so we want to save more today, but at the same time, um, an increase in interest rates might make us feel 
so rich that we actually want to save some more today, uh, save less today because we can consume more today. So those two effects may actually uh, cancel out. In, a, in the case that Andreas talked about, the log utility function uh, case, uh, the uh, periodic utility function being log would imply that they actually do cancel out. So an increase in interest rates for the, in the log case has, has neither a positive nor a negative effect uh, on savings today. But in general, uh, we think empirically that there's a, a, a slight positive effect. It can also be shown that it depends on the initial um, allocation. So uh, you know, a very wealthy household uh, will probably uh, place more, more importance on an increase in interest rates in terms of its accretion to its ability to consume, whereas a highly indebted household will have a very negative view of an increase in interest rates. So think about that. Take the simple case alluded to already, uh, log utility, um, do it as an exercise. You will have done it in the, in the section already. Um, the next step is to look at equilibrium. So we have a supply and a demand, and it's easy to see that um, what's demanded by the young uh, as savings, as gross savings, must be somehow supplied by the old people who put aside capital put aside income as capital and didn't consume it, owned it, and then are trying to cash in. It doesn't make sense not to cash in when you're old because you're not going to get anything from having a, owning a factory uh, when you're dead. So you will use that to, to increase your consumption when old. Okay, so this equilibrium uh, condition is extremely important. It's also giving us a, an equation of motion, if you like, for the capital stock over time. Okay, so you can see the capital stock tomorrow will have a relationship uh, with the size of the population, it seems to be pretty clear. So big, big populations, Ceteris Paribus will want to spend uh, more, but they'll also want to save more, so there'll be more capital tomorrow, um, all things given. And it will also depend on this savings function, which is the per capita behavior of young, young people. Okay, so if we divide by NT plus one, we can rearrange this nice uh, equation to look like a per capita, uh, per capita equation. So it just says that it's equal to the, the behavior of the individual household when young, normalized by the fact that uh, in the next period there will be more of these people around. Um, so to, if, if you want to understand how the, the net per capita capital stock is evolving, you have to account for the fact that in the next period there, there will be more uh, of these young people um, around. And um, that will sort of dilute the per capita value um, going forward. Okay, so at the moment we're going to assume perfect foresight as before, uh, and therefore we can think of this gross capital return as simply being a, um, a deterministic function of the, of the savings behavior in period T and the population evolution. So we can, we can think about it when the firm is, is uh, doing... Uh, the best it can, given uh, its technology, it's going to pay. It's going to be willing to pay, given its capital stock that it has to work with. It's going to be able to pay its marginal, um, the marginal product of that capital stock, and that mar that capital is supplied inelastically into period two, uh, into, into period t plus one. So that R t plus one has to be equal to one plus the marginal product of capital in t plus one, uh, less depreciation on that capital going forward. And we can just rewrite that by substituting what we've just derived as the capital stock per capita in T plus one. And then we have this, this nice equation for the, the, um, the rate of interest, the net rate of return on capital, the net user cost of capital going forward. Okay, so we have two relationships that are actually independent of each other uh, between our, the rental rate and capital and the wage omega, okay? Um, there's an intertemporal break between the two, but in the OLG model, we're going to sp spend most of our time in the steady state, so we'll, we'll want to know where we're going in the long run as the economy converges to something sensible. And we're going to have to ask whether this uh, equilibrium actually exists. So to do that, we need to look at the slope of this relationship to make sure that it's sloped the right way. And I'll, you'll see what I'm saying in a second. But the... Um, the classic way to do this is to take a curve and take a total differential of that curve 
uh, with respect to its two endogenous variables and see what, what shapes that, that slope. Okay, we're gonna compare that slope to the slope of the, of the factor price frontier because that's the other relationship. There's this relationship, the, the market equilibrium, the goods market equilibrium curve, people, people like to call it, Blanchard called it that with uh, Fisher in their, in their epic textbook. Um, I'm going to stick to that. I'll just call it a goods market equilibrium because there are two markets in this economy, and this one, this is the one we're going to focus on. Okay, so this curve is um, has negative slope, and um, it's negative for sure if people respond to an increase in the wage the way they're supposed to. They save a little bit, spend a little bit, um, and then if savings responds the, the correct way, if the substitution effect dominates. Okay. This is only a sufficient condition. It's not necessary, but if you have to really cook it to make everything work out um, otherwise. So we're just gonna assume that these conditions are met, and if you want, we can meet in a bar somewhere and discuss these other conditions, okay? Because there is this issue, as we've seen in the German discussion, that maybe an increase in interest rates may actually lead some people to consume more because they have lots of, of savings. But for this economy with a representative agent, uh, I think it's pretty, pretty okay to, to do what the literature has done, which is to assume that the, the uh, substitution effect either dominates or is offset. So you know, if SR, F sub R is equal to zero, the, the model still has pretty acceptable uh, characteristics. So let's plot these two uh, equations very quickly to describe the goods market equilibrium. This is a course where we spend a lot of time with graphs uh, just to reinforce intuition, and the intuition um, can be extended or even expanded using mathematics. Okay, so this is, you know, wages and capital return move in, in inverse directions um, for a given technology for two different reasons. Okay, and this is the the goods market equilibrium reason, and the other one we've already done, which is the factor price frontier, so we're done. We just have to intersect those two curves. Okay, so make sure you understand where this one comes from. I put the equation here just to remind you, and then we've got the factor price frontier, and then we can discuss uh, steady states. It must be the intersection of those two curves when RT plus one equals RT equals R star, and omega T plus one equals omega T equals omega star, and if that's the case, then the capital labor ratio has to be constant, and that's gonna be called capital uh, uh, little, little k star. Okay? So, just like in solo, we have a, an interesting uh, setup. If we did have technical progress, we'd actually, we'd actually have some per capita income growth. We shut that down on purpose. So, just in your mind, put A equals zero, but this is the same condition that we had with solo. Uh, the capital labor ratio is constant, but capital is growing at least at rate N, okay? And the wage per worker is growing at rate A, which we have set to zero. Okay, so if you like, just, just think of A equals zero uh, going forward, but this model is extendable, so we can do more with it if we want, uh, but we're gonna keep, it, keep, keep the ball, um, um, play the ball, uh, low uh, to, to get, this, uh, get this through. Okay, so the intersection of those two curves gives us the green dot. The green dot gives us omega star and R star, uh, so we're done. And you can see probably why the slopes of those curves are important. We want the goods market clearing curve to be steeper because otherwise, if we have a temporal dimension to the adjustment to equilibrium, we won't have a convergence to the dot. We will have an explosion away from the dot. Okay. Um, and to see that, you can, you can think of the model as actually characterizing a, a difference equation, a linear um, or a nonlinear uh, first order uh, difference equation. And in this particular case, in the case we're considering, it's gonna be nonlinear, and we can linearize it to characterize its, its uh, local behavior around uh, little k star. All we need to do is just plug in the equilibrium values um, given by the factor price frontier and those need not correspond to the steady state, but if there is a steady state, we will eventually reach it. So you can see that kt plus one is a function of little kt through the factor price frontier, and also it's a function implicitly of kt plus one because that determines the marginal product and uh, of capital in, the, in t, t plus one as well as the uh, 
uh, rental price of capital in t plus one. Okay, so we have this uh, we have this nice uh, implicit relationship between kt plus one, little kt plus one, and little kt. Okay, but of course it's not linear, uh, so we stick with the diagrammatic exposition for a few more minutes, and then I'll do quickly the linearization trick. Very important in macroeconomics. Most of what we have in macro is not linear, so we need to we need to take seriously the um, the behavior of the model around as an approximation, approximated model around um, the steady state. Okay, so to to sort of think about uh, stability, we just need to to ask what would happen if we were at that green dot uh, characterized by um, R one omega one, and the the red curve would imply. Uh, that basically that can't be an equilibrium because it wouldn't, wouldn't correspond to a point on the factor price frontier. So it wouldn't be consistent with firm behavior. Now to, to make it consistent with firm behavior, um, we'd, have to, we'd have to observe omega two. But omega two would imply less savings and that would imply a higher interest rate. So we'd have to move across uh, from omega two to R two, but that's also not consistent with factor price um, equilibrium factor price uh, frontier uh, behavior by the fir by firms, so that would bring us down to the to the blue curve again, and basically the logic of that would be to show that we have to be at w infinite. W infinite doesn't mean infinite time; it just means basically at any point in time. If you if you iterate um, the logic of those two curves, they cannot be consistent with each other unless we've done that iteration an infinite number of times and we've actually reached that green dot. So that green dot is supposed to characterize at any point in time um, the, the steady state behavior of the economy, okay, for a given set of behavioral characteristics, okay? Similarly, you can make the argument that if we had a, a lower wage than the steady state dot, um, you'd expect um, basically a, a rate of return on capital that's very high, and that would induce more savings, which would hi induce higher wages, which in induce um, uh, more um, capital formation, which would take some of the edge off the higher marginal product. It would still be too high, so we'd still have more savings. Wages would continue to rise until we reach uh, the dot characterized by omega infinite and little r infinite, okay? So these are just these are intuitive arguments to show why um, a stability condition like this, the the absolute uh, slope of the uh, red curve, the goods market equilibrium, has to be greater than that of the blue curve, the factor price frontier. Okay, and you can you can basically look at the the calculus around this. You can take um, a total derivative of that uh, dynamic nonlinear relationship and solve for the local uh, behavior of kt plus one given kt. Okay, that's one way of doing it. And stability intuitively would say that if I perturb kt a little bit, we don't want kt plus one to be bigger than the, the perturbation, we want it to be smaller. So it'll sort of iterate back to where we started. And that's exactly the intuition that this equation gives. And uh, we can show that formally, it's, but it's exactly the expression of the relative slopes of those two curves. Okay, so if we want, we can do this formally. There are two ways of doing it. I'll go very quickly through them. Very essential for macroeconomics. Okay, so one is to, to differentiate that relationship um, totally. I just said that. So the, the formal step would invo involve uh, basically holding everything else constant and just taking a total um, differential of that pre the first expression uh, and getting KT dkt plus one, small changes in kt plus one as a relation in, in relation to changes in uh, dkt. And of course you see the, the implicit relationship because dkt plus one is on both sides, so we need to solve and we get this beautiful relationship as before. Okay, that's the one way of doing it. Um, and the stability condition, uh, you can find it in many textbooks. It's basically a, um, uh, the assurance that the model uh, does not explode in response to a small perturbation of, of, of the economy from its equilibrium, be damped back to its stationary state. This is not guaranteed. I can cook models where this doesn't hold, and um, 
It's not clear they're very interesting. So the standard benchmark case we do in the section with Cobb-Douglas utility, um, sorry, log logarithmic utility and a Cobb-Douglas production function will guarantee that the stability uh, condition is met. But there are many, many other model specifications that also satisfy the stability condition. We can do a similar exercise, which comes into play later on in this course when we start doing dynamic macroeconomics. We start doing dynamic uh, stochastic general equilibrium uh, models um, of all different flavors. Uh, and the, this is called basically log linearization. So it's the same kind of idea. Instead of taking a total differential, you would look at the behavior of the model in terms of percentage changes around its steady state. Okay, so you have to identify the steady state and ask for the response of kt plus one as a percentage change in response to a one percentage change um, or a unit percentage change of, of kt, okay? So the nice thing about that approach is that we have something already that has no units. Um, we, we think of an elast elasticity environment, uh, which is useful for economists uh, who want to compare the behavior of Germany Sweden and the United States, these are very different sized countries, but uh, we have this feeling that maybe economic laws are kind of size invariant. Uh, and a lot of what we have found is actually confirmation of that. So this, this economy should be, this, this model of the economy should be equally valid whether we look at a small um, open economy or a large closed economy. Um, under certain conditions. That's the, that's the intuition that one would get from using the log linearization because small changes of logarithms are like percentage changes of the original variables. Okay, so let's just do that very quickly and this is really meant to be a signal uh, to you as to what's important for your future. If you choose to do macroeconomics as a field, you need to be comfortable with this type of of uh, approximation, first order Taylor approximation of logarithms of relationships. So we take natural logarithms of both of those, uh, of, of the, both sides of that equation, we're gonna get something that looks like this. So that's not very hard to understand. Um, we need to identify a steady state and look at the changes of that object with respect to the steady state, which doesn't change by construction, okay? So in the steady state we have, um, we have that equation holding. Okay, so that's a static, that's, that's like a rock. It doesn't change at all. So we're gonna ask really how, does the, how do small perturbations of the first uh, compare to this? Okay, so if we subtract this, this equation three from perturbations in equation two, we're gonna have literally changes in the logs of all of the variables that excite us and uh, those can be thought of as the last uh, um, percentage change responses to percentage change responses. Okay, it turns out we'll get the same, equal, same stability condition. It's just a different way of looking at it. Okay, so we keep in mind that these uh, two relationships characterize the, the curves. One is the factor uh, price frontier, the second one. The first one is the, is the, the goods market equilibrium condition at any, any point in time, t plus one. Um, then we're in business. We just have to do the first order Taylor approximation. So it sounds awful, but every master in economics knows how to do this in the shower. If you don't, you don't earn the name master. Uh, so go back and remind yourself what a first order Taylor approximation looks like, and it looks like that, okay? Okay, so we're talking about uh, approximating the left-hand side and the right-hand side, and then subtracting equation three in log form from both sides and rearranging. So you see what you get? You get something that looks like the percentage change. It's approximately equal to the log of kt plus one divided by k star. Okay, but this is a really convenient way of thinking about it. It's like the, the little percentage deviation dividing by 100 to get rid of the percent um, as a function of the percentage deviation or the fractional deviation of kt from k star in the in, in period T, okay? So, and that constant of dependence is uh, exactly what we had before, okay? So keep that in mind. Um, it's a linear difference equation, and it's not a differential equation. Um, 
we want um, this this um, this uh, relationship to be less than one in an absolute value. And how do I know that the, this thing has the right sign? Well, f double prime is the second derivative of the production function. That's supposed to be negative by assumption. We have decreasing uh, marginal product of capital. So the minus uh, times the minus gives us a plus. Okay, in the denominator we've got this uh, um, object which uh, will be positive if uh, the savings rate responds, the savings function has the right derivative, the sign of the derivative with respect to, to R um, is positive, and the minus uh, and the, the negative um, second derivative of the production function cancel out. Okay, so again, the same condition we had before. Um, as I said before, uh, we've already assumed that consumption in both periods are normal, so increases in income will correspond or result in increases in savings so that consumption can increase in both periods. And we just, we'll just assume that uh, savings is a positive function or a non-negative function as a sufficient condition to get this thing to, to, to work. Okay, so now we've got policy examples. Uh, we, uh, we can do these very quickly. Uh, the great exam question, I say that again, um, what is the effect of changing a, par a parameter in this model trace through the changes which curves shift? So we could think about a, a change in patients, an increase in patients would be um, a drop in the discount rate, the subjective discount rate or an increase in the discount factor. You put more weight on utility tomorrow, so you'd wanna do more for your consumption tomorrow because it's more valuable to you. You can also think about changes in the depreciation rate, changes in the growth rate of population, changes in the rate of technical progress. Were we to have it in the model? Remember, I've just set it to zero from the beginning for simplicity. Okay, so we'll take an example. And this gives you the advantage of using a, a curve approach, a graphical approach to solving these questions as a first cut. And then you can ask the hard questions, is this robust? Uh, you can't always do this in economics, and later on in advanced macroeconomics, you can't do it at all. You're going to have to use the computer, and uh, it's a bit frustrating because sometimes you want to have intuition, and intuition is often served. Um, Sometimes there, there is no intuition. Um, that's the problem with economics. Um, we need to be able to explain what we do, and this is why this is such a wonderful uh, setup. So this is a great, a great intuition um, generator for understanding why an increase in depreciation, uh, which what one might naturally associate with the, with the internet economy, the, which considers software to be a type of investment, but doesn't last very long. It's not the same thing as building this building. Um, a situation like that would, would correspond to an increase in the depreciation rate in the economy. Now, of course, this is a, an abstract mental experiment. Uh, obviously, the, the, the economy in Germany is dominated by buildings, as it is in the United States. So an increase in depreciation rate uh, resulting from the Internet revolution might only be marginal at the beginning. But over time, as people um, invest more and more in this type of technology, the role of this depreciation rate might change. On the other hand, in the long run, we still need to live in houses. We might live in worse houses, but we're gonna live in houses. Uh, we might live in, in better houses, but given the technology we have today, an increase in depreciation is not such a great thing, okay? It just means there's, there's less national product for everyone to share. Um, so the factor price frontier is gonna shift uh, inward so at any given uh, rental rate on capital that we could generate, there's gonna be lower wages. At any given wage, we're gonna be able, only able to pay capital less. And to understand the general equilibrium, we have to understand what happens with the other curve. We can't just assume that it's constant. We have to look carefully at it, and that's a little bit tricky. It could actually shift outwards. And uh, if I'm an I'm honest economist, <laughs> you have to consider that case. But if you look carefully at the uh, using sort of comparative statics arguments, the more likely shift will be inward. Um, 
and um, you can discuss that in the section if you want. The sort of off, off the wall conditions would give you an outward shift. But if it's an inward shift, <coughs> the answer is unambiguous that both factor prices will decline for <coughs> small changes. And we can be relatively, um, this is kind of a good characterization we have today. Um, you can think of this as part of the, part of the, the whole, um, the plate or the platter of, of problems that we face with, the, with, the, with secular stagnation. There's several things going on. One is population growth is declining. The other is technical progress is slowing down. So little a, should we consider it as slowing down? So those would also kind of make you expect that the rate of return on capital would drop, real interest rates would drop, but it also means the wage will slow down or drop. Okay, so this is kind of exactly what we've observed throughout the OECD uh, in, uh, in the past 15 to 20 years. So this could be a, a pretty legitimate explanation of what's going on. Now, is this the best we can do? Um, I alerted you to the beginning that uh, economists that are honest have to ask the, the, the optimum question, is this the best we can do? Is the market really gonna give us all the things we want? And there's nothing wrong or immoral uh, with asking that question <laughs> because uh, um, personally, I think the market does a great job of allocating resources. Competition is great. Uh, we need to make sure that we have competition. We need to make sure that markets are transparent, but we still have to ask the question, can we do better? Okay, and the reason we might not do better is because um, the individuals that are discounting may not have the same uh, rate of patience um, that um, um, the social planner, the government, or some sort of moral in instance, the moral judgment of generations aggregated might consider it unfair um, to take decisions that have effects on future generations uh, without having the future generations at the table. And because they're not born yet, we can't get them at the table. We can only act in, on their behalf. This is a deep, deep point, which has been raised uh, many times, especially with respect to environment, um, env environmental protection or global uh, climate change to the extent that it is happening. And I'm pretty convinced that it is happening. The question is, uh, you know, um, what is humanity's role? And I think I'm more and more convinced that humanity's role is, is not uh, negligible. Um, and there are lots of nice uh, uh, examples of where this has actually worked. Uh, think about um, uh, fluorochlorohydrocarbons in the atmosphere uh, is a great example of where global co cooperation actually could, could accomplish something. So if, to the extent that we think there's a problem, there might be a reason for humanity to get together and try to change it. So this is a very interesting way of thinking about um, the OLG model, right? Is it fair uh, to ignore unborn generations? So it's not a, it's not a trivial answer. It may, may be just fine. Maybe the, the, the market economy gets it right. So to do this, we have to set up the social planner's problem. We have to think about it carefully. And we have to um, delineate the plan of action, the course of uh, the, the, the parameters of, of control the social planner could have um, I'm going to shut down technical progress here uh, just to make things easy, but it, this is no, by no means necessary. And I'm also going to look at um, this optimality condition um, in, in, in a perspective that may be illuminating for some of you. There's a, the social planner will also care about uh, within periodic intertemporal optimality as well as intertemporal optimality. So the, 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 the social planner treats all generations equally um, or treats them unequally in a way that has to do with a discount factor. And that will make uh, a big difference in terms of comparing um, these outcomes. Okay, so we need to think about social welfare as being an aggregation of utilities of different generations. So we're gonna assume that utility is additive. This is also not, a, a controversial assumption. So we're gonna argue that you, you can compare um, individuals uh, in a quantitative way, okay? So um, I mean, even if we can't measure it directly, we can still ask the question. Um, if we can characterize some of the, some of the uh, aspects of that utility, then maybe we can still improve social welfare compared to the private outcome. The most pressing and difficult question is how to weight the generations. 
And um, this is the Ramsey problem, a uh, problem that has been boiled, has boiled over to, to discussing uh, policy action parameters with respect to climate change. How much should we wait the future generation? Should we have a very low discount rate, a very high discount factor? Or should we um, treat them as if they're just um, assets in some sort of uh, financial problem? So I tend to think probably more like Ramsey, but uh, other very serious economists, uh, more serious than myself, including the Nobel Prize uh, laureate this, this year, um, seems to think uh, differently. Okay, so we're gonna set up the problem of a central planner, this hypothetical uh, instance of, of planning genius that will sort of do everything right and see how that compares. This is a very important issue. Um, and again, if we're not dogmatic about it, if we don't think that markets uh, you know, are just the only way to do things, then we should probably ask these questions because maybe through a clever tax or a subsidy, we could make uh, the outcome better for everybody. All right, so we use a not notation is very similar to the previous. Uh, the previous uh, case, we looked at the, the private uh, sector market equilibrium, the private equilibrium, and the only notational innovation will be the use of theta, which is the central planner's discount rate. And this would apply to Benassi's Xi, uh, but use a geometric uh, weighting scheme. So as time goes, uh, as, 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 as the distance to the present increases, we exponentiate uh, the, um, the gains in the future by uh, power of t of one divided by one plus theta the social discount rate. So think of that as the social discount factor would be the inverse of one plus theta, okay? Now theta can also be negative. If you, I'll talk about this in a second. So it doesn't have to be positive. If it were zero, then the, the social planet would, would weight all generations equally. But of course, generations are growing in size. So it's not really fair to the individuals of successive generations. It's just all generations are treated equally. Um, the, the central planner may um, actually care about people, like, you know, irrespective of, of the time that they're born. In that case, the theta would have to be negative. Okay, so the social planner, um, she will choose, um, yeah, and it's interesting, she has to also deal with the currently old people. So you always have these old people around right now. If you get to re-optimize re and decide on a new plan, you still have to deal with the current old generation because they have nothing to offer. So when Social Security was introduced in the United States, this was a gift to those old people who were old in 1935. I mean, the people who were, who were already old were getting sort of a free lunch, but that's just the way it works, because you're gonna basically end up transferring resources, and you wanna make those people happy too. If you set their utility close to zero, you're gonna, you're gonna have huge gains if you really care about everyone. Um, and I'm just putting beta in front of them. That's a convention uh, that Blanchard uses, um, Blanchard and Fisher in their book, and I, I think it's just, uh, it's pretty arbitrary. Um, just as this problem is arbitrary, okay? So we're gonna use, for C, we're gonna use um, one over one plus um, theta, and we'll make recourse or reference to this theta at different points throughout the, the rest of this lecture. Okay, so the sequence of, Resource constraints, um, and it's important to stress that the, the household is not involved now. It's the, the planner. So the planner actually understands that um, if the planner saves more today, there'll be more um, uh, capital tomorrow, which will enable the social planner to produce more in, in, in the next period and future periods. Uh, and this m increase in production can be allocated arbitrarily between Current gener currently alive people, old and young at any point in time. So that gives a second degree of freedom for the social planner. The social planner doesn't have to worry about what, this, what Generation X decided to save because the social planner just decides that. The people are just sort of there and there's no market. The social planner is just giving them the resources to make them as happy as possible. And of course, we'll have to see if that thing, if that policy compares well or, or badly with what the private sector or the private decentralized equilibrium would, would come up with. We also need to be very careful. This is a sequence of re resource constraints. It's not a single one, it's a sequence. So each one is contingent on the one previous, obviously, because 
uh, kt is equal to the, um, the decision of the central planner in the previous period to save or to not to save. And therefore, think of this as a, like an accordion, um, uh, or if you like it, a bunch of puzzle pieces that can be locked into each other and to make one long sort of intertemporal budget constraint or resource constraint for the, for the planner that would involve an initial condition of capital which the central planner has to take as given, okay, that's K0, plus some end of game, last period, end of the world, apocalypse now type of uh, KT plus one. So I'll just say that could be either zero, so at the end of the world there is nothing left, or um, there's just some K bar, can't do anything with that. Okay, so those are the, that's the, in a, in a technical sense, that's the terminal condition, or the, it sort of puts a constraint on, on the, um, this chain of intertemporal uh, resource constraints that the central planner has to deal with. Okay, so these are just remarks repeating what I said before. We're gonna assume that one plus theta inverse is equal to xi, so the xi sub t would be the, the generation T's uh, weight in the social planner's uh, discount of utility function. And again, to be perfectly general, theta will generally be positive, meaning the central planner cares a little bit less about future generations. This is like individuals being a little bit selfish or a bit impatient. Okay, Ramsey objected to that. We'll see that next week when we talk about Ramsey, uh, but still, um, if you set it equal to zero, it just means the social planner cares the same way about successive generations, even though with population growth that's positive, there'll be more people. So it doesn't mean that the social planner cares about people equally, it just says that she cares about, person, uh, about generations equally. It's a very important distinction. And if this social planner is really altruistic at the personal level, it would mean that actually her she would have a, a theta that's actually less than one. Okay, that's the statement here. Um, there are some issues of, um, when, when you let capital T go to infinity, you have a problem because the, the social planner's optimum is def, may, not, may not be well defined because the, the objective function may be infinitely large. So keep that in mind. We, this was a, this was recognized in the 1960s by the, by the people who worked on this. Um, we have to be very uh, careful about infinite horizon problems. Now, Ramsey was very easy with this because in some sense, as long as theta is positive, uh, we've got a finite uh, sum. But when you start talking about global warming or uh, certain models of economic growth, you get, into, you get into issues that you need to deal with. Okay, and again, the current capital stock for the central planner, for her, it's given. She can't change the current capital stock. She can, she can do lots of stuff, but she can't, she, she's not uh, almighty God. She can't really change everything. She has to accept some things as given. Okay, so let's write this problem down more efficiently by substituting, uh, as we did in the individual household problem, in the decentralized case, we'll just eliminate uh, C1T, and we'll write this thing in terms of two um, control variables. So the central planner will choose sequences of old aged consumption for the teeth generation and capital per capita in the T plus one period from T equals zero to, inf to capital T. Um, and again, if you like Lagrange multipliers, you could do the whole problem with Lagrange multipliers, but it's a bit more, more involved and you don't need to, okay? So it's, it's just substitute and um, solve the problem. Um, again, reminding you, you're optimizing not with respect to two control variables, to, but rather with respect to two sequences of control variables. Okay, it's really important, okay? So the, um, the, the central planner always has to think, uh, because the central planner lives a long time, uh, she's gonna think about her implications of her current decision for the next period um, and that's gonna show up immediately in the second condition. Um, the first order condition, the first first order condition uh, asserts um, her ability to look within a period and try to equate 
the marginal utility of consumption for the currently alive people, young and old. So she's gonna to try to make uh, consumption moving between individuals equally valuable to her objective. And since we're evaluating all people in a period with the same sort of uh, social discount factor with respect to her initial, con initial period, then basically she chooses to treat people intratemporally in a sort of a just way, or at least since people have the same utility function, she's not gonna discriminate between old and young people. Second first order condition, sequence of first order conditions will apply to an intertemporal uh, aspect of her decision. So she will make, make sure, given that she's satisfying the first one, that the, the value of, of, of capital to utility tomorrow has the same hit with the same impact that it would have in the current period were it to be just consumed. Now the normalization variables there show up because we have population that's growing and we have an impatient central planner to the extent that theta is non-zero and therefore that's also gonna be factored in. You also have depreciation to worry about because capital today is one minus delta uh, tomorrow. Okay, so implicitly uh, weighted uh, we have both intra and intergenerational efficiency. Social planner, is, she's good, and she's doing the best she can to make this, again, this sort of a, this hill climbing problem uh, such that no incremental change of her consumption choices for currently old and young or for young today and young tomorrow, uh, no change will actually put her on a higher place, uh, on a higher hill than she's at right now, or increase her elevation, her altitude uh, with respect uh, to zero, that means that she's maximized utility. So satisfying those first order conditions are necessary for her to be, to be reaching the top, um, um, and actually making herself, as be making herself as social planner as well off as possible, vicariously um, the people that inhabit this economy. Okay, so this is a really, unbelievably powerful set of first order conditions because I, ma I can manipulate those quickly to get um, a set of first order conditions that should look familiar to you if you're paying attention. Um, it looks like basically she replicates the private sector competitive outcome, okay, in one respect. Okay, and that's the, the, the second equation. It says the marginal utility of consumption of the currently young is equal to the marginal utility of the current of the, the same young people when they become old, uh, were they to invest their capital at the the rate of, of uh, factor return that corresponds exactly to one minus delta plus the marginal product of capital tomorrow. That's exactly the equilibrium condition in the decentralized economy. Okay, so if RT plus one is equal to that term one minus delta plus F prime of KT plus one, then we have exactly um, the social planner doing what the competitive economy would have done on its own. So if you're a, if you're a market fan, this is, this is one point for you guys, okay? But I have to disappoint you, it's not necessarily uh, the whole Monty. You haven't won the game yet, you've won one of the innings, but it means that the, certainly the, the, the private sector decision will give us the right relative um, intertemporal trade-off at the private level, or the private level gives the right trade-off at the, at the uh, social planner would choose, but there is nothing in that first order condition that controls or determines or uh, replicates the social planner's choice of the aggregate capital per capita. Okay, that's the, that's the, the, um, the hitch, if you like. And it's exactly the same problem that we have with respect to efficiency, dynamic inefficiency or efficiency we saw in the solo model. Basically, there's no reason that individuals will necessarily hit the mark on the aggregate capital stock per capita. Okay, even though they're depending, even though they're all identical, uh, there's no reason, and it's easy to show, that the aggregate capital stock per capita and therefore the aggregate rate of return on capital need to correspond to the social planner's choice. So this is exactly the golden rule, and that's why I wrote golden rule reloaded, okay? And this was, uh, this was identified back in the 1960s, among others, by Paul Samuelson, the so-called turnpike theorem, which shows what the social planner would choose, and 
kind of compare that with what the OLG model, the diamond model with capital, the Samuelson model with capital uh, would do. The Turnpike Theorem, which I'm not going to derive here, but you can go to some, any good textbook or also in Benassi, uh, you, can, you can do it on your own. It's basically saying that the, the social planner, um, she has to make sacrifices because the point is, if, if you're in a, in a centrally planned economy, uh, you still have to accept K0. You still accept the per capita endowment of capital at the beginning of, of the problem. And the question is, how quickly do you want to get to something that looks like uh, what we thought would be the golden rule? And um, we learned in the solo model that if, if you, uh, you always have, if you're dynamically inefficient, there's no cost to moving very quickly to the, to, to the golden rule level because you are saving too much anyway. That's the dynamic inefficient case. That's easy for everyone to understand. And the best way to understand that is to look at the, the the failed planned economies of socialism uh, are well characterized by overinvestment. They had huge capital stocks, lots of shiny uh, factories that produced too much, lots of steel because they wanted to beat the United States on steel production, beat Germany on car production. But in fact, they, they only beat them on, on, on steel production because they were using all the steel to invest in new factories. So there's a, big, there's a lot of evidence that there's a lot of inefficient in investment going on. That's one interpretation of, of one of the failures of of the planned economy. They didn't produce enough consumption goods for the people. Okay, so that's an easy one. The hard one is if you have dynamic efficiency, you have too little capital, and the, the immediate generations following period zero have to suffer. They have to forsake consumption to get the economy uh, close to the, to the golden rule level quickly. So think of, um, I love this analogy, after World War II, Germany had lots of bombing damage, Berlin looked uh, like a garbage uh, dump and uh, a heap of rubble, basically. And a lot of people sacrificed a lot of their lives just to move in a very low productivity mode, moving b bricks and mortar and, and uh, rubble from one place to another. Uh, in doing so, sacrificed uh, their well-being for the sake of future generations. Uh, they, I don't think they were doing it for patriotism. They were probably just doing it because they felt uh, guilty. Uh, or maybe they want to do something for their children. But in any case, the central planner has the same problem. The central planner has to make uh, and force, because she can, she forces sacrifice on the, on the young, on the, the early generations in this economy, irrespective of, of whether they're young or old. And they all have to sort of forsake consumption to accumulate so we get uh, little k close and quickly um, to the golden rule level. Okay? So. And again, if you have no technical progress, the golden rule uh, level of capital corresponds to a marginal product of capital that is equal to theta, the impatience of the central planner, plus the rate of growth of population, plus delta, the rate of depreciation. So you can see that uh, you're gonna have to do a lot of um, investment to get, to get there if you're starting from a very low initial capital stock. So think of Germany, think of all those buildings that were destroyed. It took 20 years for Germany to build up, uh, it rebuild its cities again. Um, and, you know, if you watch the, f the famous movie, um, Eins, zwei, drei, with um, James, James Cagney, you see what East Berlin looked like in 1965 compared to West Berlin. And there were still rubble, piles of rubble, et cetera. The East Germans didn't do uh, the heavy lifting needed to get uh, the capital stock close to, the, to any sort of semblance of the, of the golden rule level. And if you do what Samuelson says, you're going to go relatively quickly. So the, the suffering of the, of the, of the generations at immediately following pe period zero, starting from a low K zero, is going to be considerable, but you're going to move quickly to this sort of you know, golden euphoric, euphoric uh, level. And you're going to stay there for a long time until, until it's time to, to climb down to whatever K capital T is, be it zero or some positive level, okay? Again, that's just a constraint. It could also be, um, you could kind of ignore it, but for most of the part, most of the time of the economy is spent close to the golden rule. So Phelps' uh, logic that we learned about in the first uh, couple of lectures holds true. So, you, you know, you're, you're doing something like maximizing a steady state level of consumption, but it's guided by utility theory. The, the rate of convergence is important. Uh, 
um, and that the rate of convergence will depend on the utility function, the curvature of the utility function, but also this insight of whether the planner cares about individuals or generations or has impatience at all. Okay. So, um, yeah, if you think about it, um, if the planner is impatient, the capital stock will be lower, the, 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 the effective interest rate, the marginal product of capital will be higher um, because of that. Okay. So this has interesting implications for secular stagnation. I talked about it already. I'll let you think about it on your own. If, if um, under, you know, depending on the way the cookie crumbles, the way savings behavior reacts, uh, changes in these, these uh, fundamentals might have an effect on uh, the left-hand side of that equation, the marginal product of capital at the optimum. And if you think the market is kind of close to whatever the, the optimum is or moves in the same direction, um, that will correspond to those uh, right-hand side variables. Keep in mind that delta, in my experiment, where we had the OLG model, an increase in delta actually led to a decrease in capital, um, in the marginal rate of, uh, marginal product of capital and, and, the, and the wage. That depends on the savings behavior response. And the savings behavior response of the individuals is not the social planner. So it'd be interesting to contrast those two, be a nice uh, exam question to think about. Okay, so uh, to summarize, decentralized market outcome, um, we can look at that. We already did, and I already told you that uh, the central planner will replicate something like that uh, for the individual generation uh, given the capital stock, but not necessarily choose the right path of capital over time. Okay, so the, uh, the answer has to be that we cannot assert that the market outcome is always equal to the social planner's um, preferred outcome. Okay, and this is just because we may not save enough. We might be dynamically inefficient, uh, efficient, or we might be saving too much. We might be dy dynamically inefficient. Okay, and then, um, again, this is just repeating what I said before. So there's no, ex no reason to expect um, K star, um, the steady state of the decentralized economy, to, to equal the golden rule chosen by the central planner, and that was something we learned in the solo model. So you don't need to, you know, you don't need to, to use all the high-tech um, apparatus to get the same answer, but it is interesting to see that it comes from first principles as well, okay? So you might have a situation of dynamic efficiency. We don't, we don't save enough. Uh, if we want to move to the right level of capital per capita, current generations are going to suffer, and... Um, that's something to consider. Maybe it explains the political resistance of some countries to, to engage in more savings. Um, you also might be saving too much. Saving too much. Maybe you have too much a subsidy of, of interest rates or investment, um, and it would make everyone better off to to uh, to consume more and save save less. This can also be extended to the open economy when you're saving in the form of foreign assets. So I'd like to conclude now talking about policy analysis. There are two nice applications of this model that are immediate, and if you use your imagination, there are lots of other applications that could be cooked up. I'm gonna talk about, in particular, social security and pension systems, because that's an immediate um, application of the idea of generational justice or generational equity or generational trading um, and um, trade-off in terms of welfare. Um, we can talk about asset bubbles, but we won't in this course. We can talk about technological change. We can talk about labor and capital taxation. Um, we can talk about the implications of altruism. So I'll, I'll speak a little bit about the last one uh, as well. Um, the OLG model tells us that we don't necessarily reach the social um, or the planner's optimum, and most of what these policy interventions involve are ways to push the economy a little bit closer to that, to that uh, golden rule or optimal behavior. Okay, so think of social security analysis. There are two types of, there are two extreme forms of, of private um, and public um, pension systems. We can think about the public system and the private system as, you know, probably some sort of mix of the two. So the the, the old-fashioned way before the Americans introduced uh, Social Security or 
when in Bismarck introduced uh, Rentenversicherung, uh, was basically a private system. Everyone sort of had to do their own thing. And um, you could imagine a world where we have a pension system that's fully capital funded or um, capital based, and there's no um, transfer between generations alive at any point in time. So if you, you can ask the question, what would happen if, we, if the government introduced a system that just taxed people when they were young, put the money in the stock market or in the bond market or an ETF or invested it abroad like they do in Norway and then took the gains of that and paid uh, the, the old people basically their, um, their just benefit determined by the interest rate on that investment. So ignore taxes, ignore all the other interventions. Just think about um, the marginal product of, the net marginal product of, of capital in T plus one. Okay, so um, it's, it's pretty trivial in that model to show that nothing happens. If the, if, the, if the government is just intervening by taxing you and putting money in the same investment opportunity that you would have taken advantage of anyway, then nothing will change. And just to replicate the the equilibrium. Now, of course, the government might have a better investment deal. Chances are it'll have a worse chance of realizing it. Uh, so there are a lot of good arguments um, against doing this. There's a lot of friction. You have to pay the government. Of course, you also have to pay bankers to organize your pension system privately. But the question is, um, is there any net gain from doing this? Okay, so the, the fundamental insight is that if it's an intervention that involves uh, a capital-based, uh, fully funded system, uh, the only thing you can argue um, in its favor is that people are not um, all rational. People make mistakes. People get seduced to, to spend their money when they're young and they don't have anything when they're old. Um, the government might have an interest in, in being paternalistic. Okay, So if you, if you take that view, the, there's a reason to have pension system one, even though it doesn't really change the, <clears throat> the behavior of the economy. We'll still be at the original point, <clears throat> omega given by R and omega, okay? Um, alternatively, you, could, under, you could, could imagine what happened when Bismarck came in and said, look, why don't we just um, keep it in the, in the, in the worker's family, uh, so to speak, we'll just tax young workers and give the money to workers who managed to survive uh, past age 65. Back then, that was not very many workers. It was kind of tough to be a worker in Germany back then. It was also tough to be a worker in the United States in 1935. So um, this sounded like a freebie. Now, you know, Americans live till they're 80 plus, 85, 90 years old. So there's a real issue with doing this. It has to be sort of sustainable. Um, same is true, of course, even a fortiori in Germany. Um, so we talk about a Generationsvertrag as a way of exploiting economic growth at each generation's uh, productive years, but also population growth, immigration, assuming these people are working, um, to sustain the pension system. So a lot of people see this as a Ponzi scheme, there's something uncomfortable about it. Um, the, um, I think we should challenge the, the intuition. It's not necessarily sinful to do this. It uh, might be a very rational way of dealing with uh, a world uh, with certain types of uncertainty. Um, it might be a very interesting way of dealing with certain types of dynamic inefficiency, which we'll, we'll see in a second. So the, the private first order condition for a household is getting taxed, uh, and the household doesn't care whether this is a funded system or unfunded system. It's just going to spend what it, what it gets in the second period. But what it gets in the second period is based on um, what the um, population in the second period is, is prepared and willing and able to, to pay in. And assuming that the population doesn't have a revolution, there will be more people around. So you can do this. It's sustainable and it does work. Okay, but the problem is the capital stock will be lower. Because in the aggregate, okay, people will save less. Okay? People will, the aggregate economy will be characterized by less savings because part of what would have been capital stock um, to provide the extra resources when old will be just provided by the, um, the um, more numerous or more productive people uh, that are young when, they're, um, when the, the current young are old. 
Okay, so this is easy to characterize as a rightward shift of the, of the goods market equilibrium, uh, which means that at any wage, the interest rate is gonna be higher um, because you're basically, you're incentivizing agents not to save as much. Okay, so they're getting this thing and the, um, the writing, writing on the backs of the, of the uh, future generations who are more numerous or more productive. Okay, so in the OLG model, doing this um, reduces capital formation in the aggregate um, because people don't really think about this. Um, and this model is very important to note that people don't care about their children because they don't have any children, okay? So we can think hard about what happens to K-star and what matters is basically the K-star goes down, okay? Not necessarily the case that welfare is decreased uh, by this intervention because it might be the case that you were dynamically um, inefficient to start with. You were saving too much, saving too much um, and by doing this, you're actually moving the, the economy towards a more advantageous position. This would be a case of pay-as-you-go uh, pensions actually increasing uh, aggregate welfare. But we, the usual discourse is that we save too little. Okay, so maybe uh, the introduction of Social Security in the United States in 1935 may have pushed the, uh, the economy away from the golden rule. Maybe Americans saved even less than they normally save anyway. Um, and this is a very narrowly defined problem. You have to also think about other things. You have to think about risk, okay? If you have a funded system um, with capital funding, you have to worry about risk. So Norway, even though Norway has lots of money in their pension fund, I think it's 800 billion now, but they have to worry about the the capital markets, not just in Norway, but in the rest of the world, because you know, if a country like Saudi Arabia uh, blows up, that means they've lost a, a, fair, a fair amount of cash uh, because of the, the effects of, um, of their investments across the world. I don't know why I said Saudi Arabia blowing up, but it's just an example of international incidents having effect on your rate of return. Uh, so there's risk. There's no risk in this model. Everything's certain. So okay, we have to be honest about that. Um, you also have risks of population growth. So one of the things we observe across the OECD is that population growth has been declining. And there are fewer and fewer young people to pay into a pay-as-you-go system. So if you were unwise to have put all your eggs in the population basket, uh, your older people are gonna have to increasingly deal with the fact that there's fewer young people to pay their pensions. Okay, it's not, not such a great thing. So if population is a, is a slow-moving random variable, we need to worry about that. And as we move towards a stagnating population a growth scenario, we need to start doing stuff to offset it. We have to cut pensions or we have to raise contributions. Raising contributions may affect labor supply and may affect uh, GDP per capita. We may need to um, maybe start thinking about a funded system, have a mix. Okay, so the capital-based um, um, Funded system has an advantage, um, which means you're kind of insured against that. As population growth um, um, decreases, the rate of return on capital need not uh, fall as much, and uh, there's a bit of insurance involved. Okay, so it's probably a good idea to have several pillars. This is what we have, and governments choose to move between one pillar and another. You have a public system. Um, every country has something like this. Um, China's possibly moving towards that. China has a very high savings rate. One interpretation is that people are really concerned about living a long time and uh, they have to pay for other things as well, health, health care, et cetera. Um, you uh, would want to balance that with the private system, which is capital funded, which is, which is um, uh, supervised perhaps to, to, to ensure that people don't run, run off with the money. Um, and you also have private savings, so people can save on their own. You can always do that as a third pillar. Um, and you can see that a lot of countries have recognized the necessity of balancing things out. So we see, we see Norway and Chile, um, Sweden, the Netherlands, and a bunch of other countries moving in this direction, okay? Either through tax um, advantage or ta tax uh, subsidies, meaning that you, uh, you can pay into your fund uh, out of untaxed income and pay the taxes when you take it out. That's the way it works in the United States, for example, in um, certain types of uh, government-supported pension, uh, private pension plans. Um, of course, you have to worry about fluctuation in asset prices. A market crash will cause uh, 
many individuals discomfort of their, of their, just before they're retiring and want to cash in their pension and turn it into annuity, they may be doing this at a very disadvantageous time. Think about 2008, 2009, when the U.S. stock market dropped significantly. It forced a lot of people to postpone retirement um, in a big way. My last uh, remark is about altruism, uh, and I motivate this by thinking about the implications of introducing uh, altruism in this OLG model. Think about the, the problem that, as I wrote before, utility of the household was uh, defined over consumption today and consumption of that same household tomorrow. Well, it's not difficult to, to complain. This model doesn't consider uh, the household's care and concern about future generations. Not necessarily any future generation, but in the family. So if you think family is an important part of economics, then you care about your consumption today, you care about your consumption tomorrow when you're old, um, and you also care about your children, either in the form of their utility uh, today, tomorrow, or maybe their utility in present value when you're still alive. Okay, so an easy extension of this is to add altruism in the form of behaving as if your utility were not just your own, but added to that utility is the utility of your offspring with some weight. Okay, and if your utility of your offspring, if your offspring looked like you, then they have the same problem, they're facing the same problem when they are young, and you might wanna give them some resources to start um, to make them happy, um, make them happier than they would have been had they had nothing. Okay, we call that a bequest. And if you give a bequest to, a, um, to an individual, give a, a grant to an individual that can certainly make them happier, it might make them less interested in saving in the future. It also might, might even make them less interested in working uh, in the present. Um, so again, this is what parents usually tell us. Uh, if I give you all my, my uh, wealth now, you're not gonna work. Uh, there's probably something to that, and actually economics has a lot to say about that. We're not gonna look at the labor supply decision in this case, but we're gonna look at the savings decision. It turns out that parents might try to help their children uh, by saving um, in excess of what they will use for their own consumption in the interest of steering the utility of their offspring. And if you allow that to happen, and this is the insight of uh, the, the uh, great economist Robert Barrow, who has not yet gotten the Nobel Prize, but I'm gonna go on record as predicting it, um, for his view of showing that if you allow for some altruism, uh, the OLG model actually uh, predicts that agents will kind of leap over their own shadow and take savings and investment decisions that have implications for future generations. And this internalization of the externality of not living very long in this model may to some extent be overcome. Okay, we'll talk about that next time. Uh, when we go to lecture four.